Good morning. And welcome to Willow Avenue Mennonite Church on this much cooler Sunday morning, thankfully. <laughs> Whether you are here in person or you're joining us online, we are very happy to have you here with us today. And if we haven't met before, my name is Courtney Becker Foster. If you are joining us today on Facebook Live, I would encourage you to join our Zoom meeting. You'll find a link for it down in the comments section. And there's a wonderful group of people over there who would love to meet you and get to know you. Later in the service, Doug Jones will be leading us in our prayers for the church community and world. He will be joining us on Zoom, so it'll feel a little bit different today. Uh, but you can start texting your joys and concerns to his number, which is 903-267-4496. And I want to thank Pastor Brian for his prayerful preparation for the homily that he will give us a little bit later. Today is Father's Day, a day where we celebrate and think of those in our lives who have fathered us in one way or another. For some of us, this may be a joyful experience, but for others, it may bring up some feelings that we would rather not think about. So I pray that this will be a day where we can give space to those around us and to our possibly differing emotions. I do want to comment that Arlene picked the music today because she thought it was they were all pieces that her father would enjoy. So honoring him today with the music. <clears throat> so this morning, we're going to be hearing about Queen Vashti in the Faces of Our Faith series. Uh, she is a little known character in the Bible who stood up for herself against her husband, who, of course, happened to be the king. And things didn't go well for her, but I'll leave that for Pastor Brian to talk about. So let us now listen to the singing bowl and center our hearts for worship. Let us pray. Holy and righteous God, you created us in your image. Grant us grace to contend fearlessly against evil and to make no peace with oppression. Help us to work for justice among people and nations to the glory of your name. Amen. If you'll please stand and join me in our call to worship that will be up on the screen and then continue to stand as we sing our first hymn, Praise with Joy the World's Creator, number 428 in the purple hymnal. In the beginning of Jesus's ministry, the devil tried to tempt Jesus to use his power to enrich himself. The Apostle Paul told his church, God didn't give us a spirit that is timid, but one that is powerful, loving, and self-controlled. Like God, make us brave like Vashti, like Jesus, like Paul. May we always be ready to say no to that which violates the life of faith you call us to live.
children. If you want to come up to the front. Who do we have today? Okay, the usual suspects. Do you have a name for your kids for Unicorn? Oh, you have a secret in there? Well, you better not tell us if it's a secret. So, good morning. Today in Godly Play, you're going to learn about Jonah. Do you know anything about Jonah? No? No, but what, does something ring a bell for you? What do you think you know? Mm. Oh, so that picture is reminding you of last week's story? Oh, that's good. That's good. Well, Jonah was swallowed by a fish. Can you imagine? What? Like, how gross would that be? Yeah. Yeah, exactly. So uh, he was swallowed by a fish because he didn't do what God wanted him to do. Luckily, I don't think any of that will happen to us if we don't do what God or our parents want us to do. So the story is about someone being rescued by God. I don't want to give it all away because I know you're going to talk about it in Godly Play today. But yes, the Ninevites were saved, but the story also shows that God did not give up on Jonah. Isn't that a good thing? God gave Jonah a second chance and maybe a third and a fourth. And he didn't let him run away, and he didn't let him drown. He could easily have called someone else more faithful to go to Nineveh, someone who had more compassion and mercy towards others. But maybe, just maybe, he used Jonah because Jonah needed God's rescue, not just from drowning, but from his hard heart. So sometimes we have to go through some hard times to realize that we need to change something. Yeah. All right. So you'll learn more about this today in Godly Play. And thankfully, you'll never be swallowed by a fish. Well, I don't know. If you go swimming in the ocean, I guess all bets are off. But <laughs> that's another good story. So you guys can go back to your seats. We'll be dismissed to Godly Play a little bit later. All right. God loves you, and we love you, and we're so glad you're here. Reading God, your fingers trace, number 427 in the purple hymnal, or the words will be up on the screen.
<clears throat> As a friendly reminder for any prayer requests that have not yet been made, please text your thoughts or concerns to 903-267-4496. Let us pray. Gracious God, Savior Jesus, Eternal Spirit, we come before you today thanking you for the beauty of your creation and the relationships that surround us. May we remember that all good things come from you and help us to recognize the many gifts you bestow upon us daily. Yet despite our joy, our hearts are troubled and we bring before you a number of concerns for the church, community, and world. We pray for an end to the conflicts in Gaza, Ukraine, Haiti, Congo, Sudan, Yemen, and any conflicts unknown or forgotten. Help us as your representatives of love to find ways to end these conflicts swiftly and peacefully. We pray for world leaders that they may be blessed with the wisdom and courage to make decisions that spread peace, joy, health, and love as defined by you and not the world. As a nation, help us to let go of our idols of power, money, security, nationalism, militarism, and any of the other trappings that may tempt us. May those idols be replaced by your loving example, Lord Jesus. As a country, we pray for the United States during this election season. May people feel empowered to use the mechanisms in place to peacefully make their voices heard rather than turning to violence. And may political leaders truly listen to those voices. We pray for creation care efforts happening around the world. May we find ways of protecting the animal kingdom, the plant life and climates that support us all, and the entirety of this planet. We pray for Bill Field and his health. We pray for Paul Davis and his heart issues. We pray for Sister Letha, who has severe undiagnosed pain, and we pray wisdom for her doctors. We pray for Reyes Barrios as he receives a bone marrow transplant tomorrow and the success of that procedure. We pray for strength to Marianne Isaac, a former pastor at Willow Avenue, to help her congregation face denominational rejection for the church Marianne currently pastors is welcoming and affirming. We pray for Irma Martins and her recovery. We pray for those who guide or support Willow Avenue through their time, talents, and abilities May they continue to receive your rich blessings as they lead us in worship and in service to you. We ask that you bless us with your loving wisdom so that we may know best how to lovingly respond to challenging situations we encounter in our daily lives. We ask that you teach us your loving forgiveness so that we may know how best to offer forgiveness and to be forgiven in our works of reconciliation. We ask that you grant us your loving generosity so that we may pour your abundant love onto those in need, whomever they may be and whatever their needs may look like. May you root us in your love, drawing us into a deeper relationship with you so that we may be transformed into your likeness and transform the world around us. We offer these prayers in your most holy and glorious name. Amen. Please join me on 804. There's more love somewhere. <clears throat> We're going to be using love and peace. <clears throat> There is more love somewhere There is more love 
This morning's reading is Esther 1. This is what happened back when Ahasuerus lived. The very Ahasuerus who ruled from India to Kush, 127 provinces in all. At that time, Ahasuerus ruled his kingdom from his royal throne in the fortified port of Susa. In the third year of his rule, he hosted a feast for all his officials and courtiers. The leaders of Persia and Medea attended along with his provincial officials and officers. He showed off the awesome riches of his kingdom and beautiful treasures as mirrors of how very great he was. The event lasted a long time, six whole months to be exact. After that, the king held a seven-day feast for everyone in the fortified, fortified port of Susa. Whether they were important people in the town or not, they all met in the walled garden of the royal palace. White linen curtains and purple hangings were held up by shining white and red purple ropes tied to silver rings and marble posts. Gold and silver couches sat on a mosaic floor made of gleaming purple crystal, marble, and mother of pearl. They served drinks in cups made of gold, and each cup was different. The king made sure there was plenty of royal wine. Rule about the drinks, no limits. The king had ordered everyone serving wine in the palace to offer as much as each guest wanted. At the same time, Queen Vashti held a feast for women in King Ahasuerus's palace. On the seventh day, when wine had put the king in high spirits, he gave an order to Mehuman, Biztha, Harbona, Bigtha, Abagtha, Zethar, and Carcass, the seven enochs who served King Ahasuerus personally. They were to bring Queen Vashti before him wearing the royal crown. She was gorgeous, and he wanted to show off her beauty both to the general public and his important guests. The Queen Vashti refused to come as the king had ordered through the enochs. The king was furious, his anger boiling inside. Now when a need arose, the king would often talk with certain very smart people about the best way to handle it. They were people who knew both the kingdom's written laws and what judges had decided about cases in the past. The ones he talked with most often were Karshena, Shethar, Admatha, Tarshish, Meres, Marsena, and Mimukan. They were seven very important people in Persia and Medea who, as the kingdom's highest leaders, were in the king's inner circle. So the king said to them, according to the law, what should I do with Queen Vashti, Vashti since she didn't do what King Ahasuerus ordered her through the enochs? Then Mimukan spoke up in front of the king and the officials. Queen Vashti, he said, has done something wrong, not just to the king himself. She has also done wrong to all the officials and peoples in the province of King Ahasuerus. There's, this is the reason. News of what the queen did will reach all women, making them look down on their husbands. They will say, King Ahasuerus has ordered servants to bring Queen Vashti before him, but she refused to come. This very day, the important women of Persia and Medea who hear about the queen will tell royal officials the same thing. There will be no end of put downs and arguments. Now, if the king wishes, let him send out a royal order and have it written into the laws of Persia and Medea, laws no one can ever change. It should say that Vashti will never again come before King Ahasuerus. It should also say that the king will give her royal place to someone better than she. When the order becomes public through the whole empire, vast as it is, 
Women will treat their husbands properly. The rule should touch everyone, whether from an important family or not. The king liked this plan, as did the other men. And he did just what Memucan said. He sent written orders to all the king's provinces. Each province received it written in its own alphabet, and each people received it in its own language. It said that each husband should rule over his own house. May we find God's wisdom in these words. <laughs> Please join us now in singing Beauty for Brokenness, number 712, and kids, you can go off to godly play with Nancy. Jesus. 
As I was nearing the completion of spending more time in school than is otherwise advisable, I began to apply for jobs to teach biblical studies at universities and seminaries across the country. Some schools required applicants to check a box to a deceptively simple question saying either yes or no. The question was this, do you agree with our confession of faith? So trying to be a good Anabaptist who would let my yes be yes and my no be no, I wrestled with what to do. Those confession of faith statements were wordy, and with training as a biblical scholar, it was easy enough to find things I could disagree with. So the truth was invariably no, at least not all of it. But checking no would invite scrutiny of my application and could easily lead to my application being dismissed when they learned what I disagreed with. So I considered checking yes and lying. For moral justification, I drew inspiration from Shifra and Pua, the Hebrew midwives who lied to Pharaoh to protect themselves. We'll learn about them next week. But hiding my personal values didn't seem like an option, given that my scholarship worked with feminist and queer approaches to biblical interpretation. I'd be outed soon enough. Which box then to tick? Yes or no? Well, I suspect that many of us haven't heard of Vashti. When the king summoned her to display her beauty before his officials, I could imagine her wrestling with similar questions. Do I say yes or do I say no? It's a situation, I think, not unlike what Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego faced when confronted with the decree to bow before and worship the king's statue in Daniel 3. As Doug Jones laid out for us two weeks ago, while they'd otherwise found ways to navigate the tension between sabotage and assimilation, now they faced a choice. I think Vashti's story echoes not only themes like this, but also themes related to gender and discrimination that intersect with Pastor Jerry's sermon from last week. Indeed, Vashti's story in the book of Esther within which it is set has long been of interest to feminist biblical scholars. The Woman's Bible was a groundbreaking piece of feminist biblical scholarship published in the late 19th century. In it, Elizabeth Cady Stanton celebrates Vashti as, quote, one who scorned the apostles' command, wives obey your husbands. Likewise, co-contributor to the project, Lucinda B. Chandler, hails Vashti as, quote, the first woman who dared. As Pastor Jerry put it last week, it's tempting, I think, to make Vashti's story one of women's rights. And I also think our text is more complicated than that. The Book of Esther is a short story set in the time after the Babylonian Empire conquered Jerusalem. It opens with the Persian king throwing two feasts, the first of which lasts for 180 days. The second features drinking without restraint, and after mentioning this second feast, the text introduces Vashti, who is giving her own banquet for the women of the palace. Verse 11 describes Vashti as fair to behold in the context of the king commanding his officials to bring her before him so that he could show off her beauty before the people and officials. Verse 12 then reports that Vashti refused to come. The king and his officials move quickly to quell what they fear. Word will get out and we will face gender rebellion. The male leaders issue a proclamation that every man should be master in his own house. And as some of us began to chuckle, some have wondered, could this be a bit of satire? Perhaps, perhaps there's a bit of a satirical poke here at the male leaders as the decree comes from a man unable to master his own house. Likewise, their decree spreads word of what Vashti has done, perhaps a bit ironic in that they feared what would happen if others heard, and now their decree spreads word. Likewise, the decree even conveys the ease with which such decrees can be disobeyed, 
perhaps another poke at the leaders as they'd like people to comply with this decree. But just as the decree goes out, so too does Vashti, who disappears, and she is eventually replaced by Esther. So Vashti's story is brief. She says nothing and does two things. She gives a banquet and she refuses to come. Once she's replaced by Esther, Esther does intervene to save her people, but the book doesn't suggest that God somehow orchestrated this, working behind the scenes to remove Vashti and ensure Esther was in place for later developments. Indeed, one of the curiosities of the book of Esther is it makes no mention of God at all. What then might we glean and learn from Vashti, a lesser known and overlooked biblical character? Arguably, her most significant act is her refusal to come when summoned, but it's also terribly difficult to interpret because the text doesn't tell us why she refused. I'll pause for just a moment and give you a chance to reflect. Why do you think Vashti refused? Hold on to those ideas. Maybe jot them down as fodder to start sermon talk with. For now, I'll suggest a few options and hope you all can suggest others as well. One option is that maybe Vashti is simply busy with her own banquet. If so, she might refuse because she needs to ensure she can care for the guests at her own banquet. Duty calls, after all. Another option might be that Vashti knows that the king has been displaying the great wealth of his kingdom and the splendor and pomp of his majesty for many days, as verse 4 puts it, and now he wants to show people her beauty? That'd make her like those other things, his object. Her body and her beauty is hers to do with as she wants. She will be no man's object. She refuses to subject herself to the male gaze. Vashti was the woman who dared, as Chandler put it. Another option might make it more complicated than that, if we think about this amidst a patriarchal cultural context that might expect women to not parade their beauty before men other than their husbands. If such cultural norms about female modesty are part of the backdrop of this text, the king made an inappropriate request. If Vashti then complies with this request, she, for her part, could violate gendered expectations for her. From this vantage point, maybe Vashti's refusal seeks to comply with, rather than resist, patriarchal expectations. Expectations about female modesty, in this case. Or maybe it's just that Vashti faces an impossible choice when she was summoned. Her options would seem to be to comply or to refuse. If she complies with an improper command, she too will have done something wrong which could lead to its own trouble for her, especially if she anticipates being held accountable for the misbehavior of her husband. So that's not a good option. If, on the other hand, she refuses, well, we know how that went. So that also doesn't seem to be a good option. And maybe there isn't a good option for her. She's between a rock and a hard place. And so I wonder, how do you, how do we interpret Vashti's refusal? Is it a story of women's empowerment? It's certainly possible to construe her refusal as her sticking up for herself and her rights as a woman, but I think the text is more complicated, and not just because of the lack of a clear answer about why she refuses. For instance, by the end of chapter 1, male dominance is legislated. In the next chapter, the king will gather beautiful young virgins, including Esther, from throughout the provinces to see which one would please him enough to become Vashi's replacement. 
Of course, in this contest, the girl's consent is irrelevant. So men in power respond to Vashti's refusal with actions that further harm other women and girls. As Pastor Jerry said last week, reflecting on the daughters of Zelophehad, sometimes it feels like two steps forward and one step backwards. But while there might have been some apparent or temporary gains for the daughters of Zelophehad, the response of the men in power in Vashti's story may feel more simply like two steps backwards. But perhaps the gain here is in the crack her refusal inserts into the patriarchal system. Her refusal leads to fear, substantial fear, among the men in power. Memukhan, one of the king's officials, frames her actions as not simply against the king, but against all the officials and all the people who are in all the provinces. Yes, if you were counting, that was all three times in quick succession. Surely he is overreacting to the situation, right? Perhaps, or perhaps not. Memukhan continues by explaining why he sees it in such terms. If the other women hear what Vashti did, what's to stop them from likewise refusing to comply with their own husbands? It's the power of an example. Other women might well see in Vashti an example and be inspired to do likewise. And so I wonder, what do we make of Vashti? Might we find inspiration in her refusal for whatever reasons and for whatever complex calculations she made? Her actions, I think, show how refusing to comply can disrupt systems of power, a point that extends well beyond gender. The work to bring a new world into being, as we'll sing in just a moment, remains. A new world where each gender, class, and race brings its rainbow colors to God's limitless embrace, as the song goes. A world where the word is one of welcome to the greatest and the least, calling those with power to service and all to share the feast, as our other hymn of response will put it. May we find strength and courage for the work ahead in Vashti's story. Amen. Who Will Speak a Word of Warning is a new song for us. So Arlene is going to play it through once first, and then you can join in on the first verse. Stop. 
I'm so glad you were all able to join us here this morning, and I hope that it was a meaningful service for you. If you are joining us online, I would encourage you to stick around for the fellowship that will happen before the second hour starts. There's lots of catching up and gabbing that happens during that time with those online. And for those of you who are here in person, I would encourage you to go across the courtyard to the fellowship hall where there will be a time of refreshment. In the second hour, it's a little different from normal. It's same as last week. Sermon talk will be in here, and the membership class, the orientation class, will be happening in the conference room. Um, and the youth will be joining in with the membership class today in there, not here. And the kids will be retelling the story of Jonah with Donna Jost in the library. I want to take this opportunity to thank all of you who give so much to our community whether it be working on beautifying the campus during the week or financially through a donation by putting it in the box in the back or sending a check through the mail or clicking on that PayPal link on our website. As for the life of the church, kids camp, it starts tomorrow, yay. I'm not helping with it, but you know. <laughs> we can still be excited for the kids. Um, so that is happening Monday through Thursday morning. And then on Friday night, there is a family fun night that will be here at 530. There will be a water slide and water games and all kinds of stuff. And the weather doesn't look like it's going to be that hot. So that will be nice. Um, I also want to thank everybody who came yesterday to help the Howards pack. It was a bittersweet moment. Uh, we, we, I watched mostly, but somehow people got all of the stuff jangled into these two moving trucks and we didn't think it would all fit, but somehow it did. So they are off to Reading and their new journeys. So thank you for everybody that came and helped with that. And also want to mention in the bulletin, uh, the Outreach Commission invites you to join the next mass call of Mennonite Action. It's going to be from 5 to 6.30 on Thursday, June 20th. Um, the topic will be Christian Zionism. And you can register on your own, uh, but if you want to, Brian will be here that night in the conference room and you can all watch it together and then have a discussion afterwards. Um, so that should be a good time to uh, get together with fellow Mennonites and try to figure out what to do with what's happening in the world <laughs> in a peaceful way. Okay, so please stand and we will sing, sing a new world into being number 809. Yeah. 
May God bless you with a restless discomfort about easy answers, half-truths, and superficial relationships, so that you may seek truth boldly and love deep within your heart. May God bless you with holy anger at injustice, oppression, and exploitation of people, so that you may work tirelessly for justice, freedom, and peace. May God bless you with the gift of tears to shed for all who suffer from pain, rejection, and starvation, so that you may reach out to bring comfort and transform pain into joy. May God bless you with enough, enough foolishness to believe that you really can make a difference in this world, so that you are able, with God's grace, to do what others claim cannot be done. Go in peace.